How's it going guys? John here. This is The Basic Expert and I wanted to make a second video this week. I don't always do that. Um, I did it last week with uh, Welcome to St. Cloud and you know, don't expect us two videos a week all the time, but if I feel inspired to do so, I'm going to try and do that. First off, if you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my uh, subscribe star. I have uh, five supporters right now. Thank you guys for supporting my channel and what I do. At $1 a month, you get a dungeon map a, uh, a week, which is a pretty good deal, I think. These are Roll20 compatible. If you look at them here. Uh, if it'll load. There we go. Uh, these are Roll20 compa compatible. Uh, you also get stuff like Adventures. This is this month's Adventure, the Machine sor Sorcerer. It's a two-level dungeon. Uh, again, these are Roll20 compatible at 70 pixels per square. And you can check those out and uh, get other perks and bonuses and support the work that I'm doing here. I wanted to bring it back to this. I've, I've had this article kind of bookmarked for a while and um, I kind of wanted to talk about it because it's there's some good insight in this and there's also some um, some things I disagree with. And I've made multiple videos on Dungeon Master Prep, what I, what I do personally for Dungeon Master Prep. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about that before and so I kind of wanted to delve into it and kind of give my take on this person's idea. So for me, I do a lot of improv. I do a lot of just like constructing the bare bone essentials of the world that the players are going to adventure in. And then I just let them go. I'm doing that with Traveler game that I'm working on. Although the Traveler game that I'm running, I am using the official third Imperium setting, which uses the Traveler map. I'm using the Traveler map, I'm using the wiki, the wiki pages, and some pre-written adventures to supplement what I'm doing in that. But regardless, I, I sort of throw things out there that might interest my players, and in that Traveler, classic Traveler game, I let them go after what they want. In my basic fantasy game, uh, basic fantasy slash uh, rule cyclopedia hybrid game that I'm running, which I've been doing a video series on, on basic fantasy, um... I sort of just made the world map. I threw the players in it into a, into a particular city, started them with some basic fantasy modules that are free for PDFs, or I, I, I purchased Chaotic Caves in print, which was, those are always printed at cost. Great, great deal for those. And um, so I, I threw those out there uh, for my players, let them, and I just kind of let them go wherever they want and do what they want to do, and I kind of make up plots as they go. And I try and insert things. So some of the things in here that I think are good insights are things that I'm already doing in, that are in this article. There's some things that I disagree with. I feel like this author is kind of taking the more modern approach, which I don't particularly care for, which is this very story gamer aspect. And I used to come from a story gamer back, back a story gamer background because I come from a more new, new school sort of mentality. Um, I started in fourth edition and I used to run actually very story light dungeon crawl games in fourth edition which i'm not sure that's the best system for that but that's what i thought dungeons and dragons was came to fifth edition and started watching people like uh matt colville and um, a lot of others who kind of do a little bit more of a narrative story driven game where they kind of plan out you know beats uh they they, they do more of a skeletal frame for a story for adventure and i tried doing that for a while and it just never really worked for me. I didn't really enjoy it. And I felt like uh, I, I felt like I was railroading my, my players a little too much. And I just felt like it was too much prep. Too much on my plate for me to do. And so I have made the switch to OSR. I've talked about this many times. And I start, started running a more sandbox sort of... When I tell players, like, there's a black dragon in the marshes that, to, the, to the west... Uh, that's literally all I have planned. And if they decide to go that way, we'll flesh it out through dice rolls and improvisation and figure out what happens. And to do that, I've often, I, I've read a lot of classical mythology um, as well as Appendix N stuff from first edition to, you know, other sorts of fantasy and sci-fi that I like, such as Dune or the Dragonlance novels. Um, I'm actually kind of a fan of the Legend of the Five Rings novels. They're, um, they're, those are pretty enjoyable books, uh, despite how kind of schlocky they are. Anything like that, Lord of the Rings, anything, can be influential in try, trying to give you a, a toolbox from which you can draw from. This person's taking a different approach, where they're taking a more narrative-based approach, and 
Uh, well, let, let's talk about it. So they talk about this red thread, and we'll, we're going to skim through this article. We're not going to read it all the way through. So they say, what is the red thread? And they said, as it was taught to me, the red thread is the element of a story. And I already have an issue with that because we're using story. And I'll get to that in a minute. That is present throughout the work. It might sometimes be very direct and impossible to miss, but it also might be more subtle from time to time. Ultimately, the red thread is the common denominator that ties everything together in a story. Again, the S word. It's what creates a sense of consistency in uniting a collection of scenes or elements in a story. You might know this uh, as a through line or common thread. For me, at least, thinking of it as a red thread helps make it seem more tangible and significant. Um, and so then, how do you use red thread? Uh, in many ways, planning a D&D adventure is like writing a book. And this is where I have issues with this. It's not like writing a book, in my opinion, uh, playing a D&D &D adventure. It's, it's not. Though it's not the way I view it. If you read, for instance, my adventures on my Subscribestar, if you're a Subscribestar supporter and you read them, they're pretty bare bones. I don't put names of places. I have only the relevant information for that because I don't know where I'm going to put these because I don't know where my players are going to go. And I want to have some place where I could take this adventure that I've written, which is really just a series of, in a dungeon, for instance, a series of rooms. There's a loose story there. So like in the Machine Sorcerer one, which is this month's Subscribe Star adventure, you know, um, the players are sent by their patron in order to get a uh, uh, the the tome of Cinefred the the tinker the, the the maker who is like this machinist magical user machinist guy who from ancient times who said to have made these magical machines and you know someone's found where his lair is or there's rumors that someone knows where his layers are his lair is so the PCs are sent there to go and explore his lair. And maybe Cinefred's there. Maybe Cinefred is is dead. Who knows what's roaming in there? But they they have been sent by a patron or a client or someone who gives them this quest to go and look for the books or the the notes or even the artifacts of Cinefred that to bring back, which could bring the player character and their patron great reward and great power if the technology, this magical technology that they found is is useful. So. I don't put like it has to be in this forest is where the layer is. I have it set bare bones for me and for you so that you can place it anywhere you need it to be. So all of a sudden, like if they stumble across it, all of a sudden it's they it just happened upon. They're the ones that discovered Cinefred's lair. They're the ones that found it. And so now they can explore it and then find a buyer for anything that they find inside of, of Cinefred's lair, uh, whatever, if they survive. Um. So that's kind of how I structure it. So there's like a loose plot in there, you know, um, in in this one, it's like, are the machines of Cinefred kind of just running, running amok in the dungeon? Is, is there another NPC party adventure in there that maybe is stumbled upon the lair as well? These are all things that I consider that kind of just leave it open so that players can interact with the setting and the story can be emergent. I don't... the for me, I, I have issues with this of like comparing it to a story or to writing a book because my player characters are not uh, characters in a novel that I'm writing for. And they're, they're not actors in a play that are acting out my play. That's boring. If I wanted to do that, I'd go be a playwright or I'd go be in a play or my players would go to the local uh, theater troupe and would engage in some local theater if, they, if that's what they really wanted. We're there to play a game and to me, the way we play that game is if both I and them kind of go in not knowing what's going to happen exactly. That's what makes it enjoyable for me as a dungeon master, and I think that's what makes it enjoyable for them. And I think that when I tie all of these loose ends together, and at, when they exit the dungeon, there was somehow a story that was involved in there that um, had its ups and downs, its adventure, its highs, its lows, its edgier seat stuff. I know that 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 to me is way more rewarding than like, oh good, the players didn't derail my, my story that I planned for them. So that's where I have an issue here where I don't think that playing a d and uh, planning a D&D adventure is like writing a book. Because they say here, however, you also have no control over what the chaotic gremlins, I mean players, will do next. Otherwise, you risk turning, the, turning 
into a railroading dam, and that is not a good thing in a game that is about choices. I agree. But see, the, the thing is, is that you in a, in a, invariably end up being tempted to railroad players when you, I think, plan games and adventures in a way where they feel like a story. Where, you're, where you approach it as a story. That's not, again, how I approach it. So they say, so how do you how do you do that? How do you use this red thread? And this is where it kind of could be useful, what this, this advice that they give. Uh, in some, the red thread may be a huge impossible to miss presence. For example, the party is storming the fort uh, to take out a big bad evil guy's loyal lieutenant and send a message that's clear and obvious connection between the scene and I don't like referring to scenarios or encounters as scenes but i'll let it slide and the overarching story against the big bad evil guy so for me a couple of things i don't first of all really plan big bad evil guys um i have npc enemies that could potentially be big bad evil guys for instance the mayor of the town sale hall for my characters has kind of been was a backstabbing two-timing piece of human trash that my players don't like and uh, now that the church of Sunan, who, who is like the predominant monotheistic religion in my world, is because the players have kind of usurped the mayor of Sailfall, kind of threw a wrench in his plans. He was giving, he was protecting his town by giving uh, slaves to or two orc tribes, and the players instigated a. It's a whole long thing. They instigated a civil war between the tribes, and uh, came back to town rescued the cleric that was investigating all of this, brought the cleric back to Creighton, which is like the bigger town that uh, Sailfall is sort of a, a fiefdom to. And they um, are, you know, were able to explain to the church leaders there of the Church of Sunon what had occurred, that there's some heresy going on essentially because the, the slaves were not just being used for slave labor. A lot of them were being used as sacrifices to the Orcish gods within the uh, within the temple that was with that the the two the two tribes shared and so now you know what's going to happen with that na the mayor up in the north of Sailfall is, is he going to abandon that uh there were talks of Claire, uh, of of uh bandits about is he going to join the bandits potentially like what what could happen could this guy rise up to being a big bad evil guy that's my goal with that right there um, currently, they're in Creighton, and they're kind of been sidetracked as the, the princess of Creighton has been kidnapped by what appears to now be vampires. And there's an ancient elven... Uh, you can read all this in my, um, in, in my uh, play reports on my blog. Link, will be, link is in the video description, but to plan it out, or to explain it here, uh, the players have kind of been they've fought some undead in the sewers they thought that was connected it was kind of a red herring and it was just its own separate god awfulness that was in the city of Graydon. um they've so now they're they're working with uh the court wizard the court magic user the court sorcerer and the the steward of of the king because the king has kind of gone mad with the loss of his daughter and they're they've captured two vampires that were working within the castle that obviously helped orchestrate the kidnapping of the princess and they've met this that that there's this sort of what appears what is claimed to be an elvish princess who is possibly maybe the vampire who is threatening to um to who wants the king to step down uh, to abdicate the throne in order to return his daughter his princess the the daughter safely so there's this whole thing the players are going to go off and look for this uh, elven princess uh, who's, who may or may not have captured the princess of Creighton. And, you know, what's going to happen there if, if, that, if that princess is a real person and gets away? And could that potentially be another big, bad, evil guy? I don't know. I don't sit there and plan it because the moment I plan that, uh, it never works out for me. I, I did this in my last Vanilla 5e campaign where I... I kind of did this uh, Alex Jones type thing of like lizard people behind the scenes uh, are in positions of power that are shapeshifters. And uh, it was interesting, but my players were not as interested in that villain as they were in the villain that I sort of like half-assed threw in there that was a leader of a, of a totally separate cult that was seeking ancient evil relics. And that villain sort of arose organically from play. And, that, and because of that, 
my players enjoyed that big bad evil guy way more than the one that I had planned, the one that I was trying to foist upon them. So what I would suggest in regards to this advice, let's continue reading here. So it could be assaulting the lieutenant, and that's obvious as the big red thread, they say. Other times the red thread might be subdued. The party is taking out a gang of bandits that have been terrorized in the area, while in the base they notice crates of supplies stamped with the same logo they saw in the evil cult's lair. Who is providing supplies to these evil factions? We should investigate. So I like this way a little more. So let's say um, my players go back to Sailfall and the mayor is gone, but you know, you know, there's these subtle hints all over the place that he's maybe allied with uh, evil clerics or uh, a bandit uh, gang or something like that. So they then go on and talk about the red the red thread and the MacGuffin. The MacGuffin is just the thing that the players are after, as I explain here. Um, I don't I mean that's kind of a given in these kinds of games that you have something like that. Uh, but how long is the red thread? They kind of give this is where I have other issues here where they kind of compare it to Lord of the Rings, which I get, but then also think is a bad comparison because again, Tolkien was writing a novel where he could make the characters do whatever he wants. So he says, Phase one, measure your thread. Uh, you should walk away from session zero knowing what kind of key themes your campaign is going to explore. I ideally, you can also pretty quickly answer some important questions. Where is the party starting? That's a good question. Where do they need to go? Don't like that question. I let the party decide that. I, again, throw out a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different plot threads, a bunch of different rumors that they could pursue, and then that's how I define where they should go, and then that's how I... Some adventure might just be like a one to two thing adventure before they move on, one to two session sort of adventure before they move on to something else, and that might never come up again. The characters of that one to two session thing might never come up again because it's just not relevant, the players weren't that interested, or whatever reason, I forget about them, it doesn't matter. Um, if, if something, I'm always watching my players to see in my sandbox game if something is resonating with them, if something does pique their interest or makes them interested in what is going on in the world and I know that like okay that's something they're interested in I can bring that back later and that will interest them that will keep them engaged and will be like oh it's that guy it's that thing from last time cool um that's that's kind of my mentality with that I don't try and dictate where they need to go for them that's just not my style uh why do they need to go there and or what do they need the MacGuffin and then they give the example of the party is starting the Shire, they need to go to Rivendell to deliver the One Ring to Elrond. And then they go on how, well, they get to Rivendell and they realize that, that the system starts over again, the party's got to, they're going to begin in Rivendell, they need to get to Mordor to cast the One Ring into the fires of Mount Doom. Again, I, I get what they're trying to say, but I think, in my mind, comparing this to literature or a movie, where it's a very structured thing, and... um the actors in the movie or the characters in the book are going to do pretty much exactly what you as the writer or the director need them to do to tell the story. Uh, there is no showing up to set as a director and going like, gee, I wonder, wonder what it's going to be. There's very few movies that are made that way where they're like, I have no idea. I mean, David Lynch is kind of like that, but not everyone's a David Lynch. Um, so then you've got to connect the dots, uh, putting multiple threads together. Conclusion, um, I think there's some good advice in this article. I'll link to it in the video description, but I would ignore anything where you are planning out an adventure. And instead, I'm going to show you something really cool that you can get for $2.99. Um, let me go to my drive through RPG here. And this here by uh, Felbrig Harriet is a fantastic thing which is a fantasy scenario mission generator and he's made a video about it on his youtube channel you can check it out there but i downloaded this because this seems like something that i could use to kind of make an adventure to kind of really aid myself in the making an adventure on the spot because i truly want to run a pure sandbox game because that's again part of the thrill for me is uh showing up to the table I have a rough skeletal view of like what the setting is like and who 
who the enemies of the players are, but I don't know what's going to happen, and I love that. Um, so, the fantasy scenario generator, the way this works is you get uh, this little HTML document. You can just drag it into your browser, um, and it opens this up, generate a mission. So here's the main plot. It's an investigation. Uh, what is this? It's a power source in a monster lair where there are orcs. So maybe the orcs are uh, doing some kind of... They have some kind of magical relic, let's say. I can. This is something I can use to make up a story on the spot that is interesting to my players. You have a subplot here. Exploration, urban, tower, friend, abandoned tower, professional warrior. Maybe the friend is a professional warrior who is giving them this quest, and there's a little side tangent where they can learn about this power source in maybe one of the towns that is being affected by uh, this this orc layer that has this magical power source uh, and they have a, a friend who is a professional warrior, maybe a higher level NPC, who is going to give them information on this in, in, that, in that place at some point. That's, that's an option that they can pursue. You have the NPCs, you get a name, uh, Dugan Ebery the Sneaky, he's optimistic and mature adult, environment, uh, solar interruptions, simmering hills. So. You get uh, danger level, terrain type, and the hazard, solar interruptions. Um, that could be anything. Uh, and the town, Burnt Cup, uh, predominantly dwarf, and they are all mean-spirited people, probably because orcs are over here causing some kind of shenanigans in their town. Easy sort of thing here. I would use this and just sort of uh, let the players give the players this information and just see what happens. One other thing that I will use here, uh, we go to my itch, I would use my blue dungeon generator here, which I've shown video be appearing here, somewhere over here I think, where uh, I kind of show how I would use this. And essentially the way this works is you get a bunch of different geomorph tiles that you can use. And these are Roll20 compatible. Uh, they look like this. And uh, you can connect them any way you want. And you can construct a dungeon on the fly. Much easier than even using the first edition dungeon generator, which I think is fantastic, but might slow you down a little bit because uh, you're going to have to be drawing everything at the same time, at least with this. Like the shape of a room and or a hallway or anything like that is already designed for you. Uh, I would use this. So this I could use this for this guy here, where uh, this is the layer, and I use my dungeon generator here to flesh out what that layer's uh, area looks like, and place I could place monsters and, and as they generate it, or I could just do it all on the fly. That there's something special like rewarding wise to me of doing that, and especially when you tell the players after the fact like. I made all that up on the spot and they're like oh really I didn't know that makes me feel good so yes I think there's some good advice in this article um, for instance again this this idea of um, um, you know who's providing supplies to these evil factions I like these sort of subtle connections that you can use you need to be on the lookout for again things that resonate with your players uh, so for for instance, my players like really hate that mayor of Sailfall who who double crossed them, and uh, um, extorted them, and you know was feeding townsfolk or or visitors to town to orcs to be used to sacrifice as slaves. My players have real issues with that guy. So if I bring him back periodically, and maybe event, that's very satisfying to my players, uh, and they also if they end up killing this guy or bringing him to justice, they get a sense of satisfaction, I think. And it's much more rewarding to them because it's a, it's almost a villain of their own design. It's something that, and someone that they interacted with in the game. It's not some far off big, big, bad evil guy that they don't know. Um, they've, they've directly dealt with this guy and he double crossed them and he was a bad guy who hurts people. And so, if we can take this guy down, if we can deal justice to him, that makes us feel good, not just in our characters, but as 
players as people playing these characters. It's there's a cathartic um nature to that where they feel invested in the in the game because of that. And the story sort of arises naturally. This is not a story that is um that this story of this mayor is stuff that all that I all made up on the fly in order to keep the game going. Because they're gonna ask your players are gonna ask questions that you don't have the answer to. And so you just have to make up an answer on the spot, write that answer down in your notes, and remember that. And that's for me how I build my world. That's for me how I uh construct a story. It just sort of emerges from the gameplay, it just sort of happens. And that's what I like about this mode of play. As opposed to this more story gamer approach. I I really personally think, and this is my advice for the end of this video really personally think that if you can detach your mind from the concept of this being a story or similar to a book or a movie or or a play or anything like that and you view it as its own special separate thing that's why we're playing the game i think your games and your your expectations and the way you run your game will become easier uh more enjoyable and more enjoyable for your players too not just for you as a, as a dungeon master and you're both going to go in if you can work on your improvisational skills and you have the right tools uh, like these in order to to do what you need to do in order to make stuff up on the fly and it, it sounds lazy because it kind of is it sounds lazy because it kind of is but your players are going to be much more invested in the world when it when they feel like they are because they do have a say in the way the things and the in the in the, the the events of the world occur because they they feel like they can affect the world rather than them fighting against you and your story, which is what I feel inevitably always happens to most people who view this as a story. As we're just getting together for story time. That's not what D&D &D is. It's not. It's, it's far more nuanced and complex than that. A story can organically arise from play, but it is not for me a story that I sat down and typed out like I'm some kind of author and gave to my players and like you're playing this part you're playing this part and you're playing this part it's I constructed a world I made a map and I let's see what happens I roughly know where each faction is and a little bit about their backstory and who they are and what kind of culture they are but that's about it because I need that sort of thing to be pre-set up for my players as they roam about the world um, and uh, try and explore but other than that, I don't have a big bad evil guy planned out. I don't. That's never worked for me. It generally never works for me. Not as it doesn't. I, I think this is where the six session burnout happens, and it's this story gamer mentality. I think it's just too imbalanced of a of a mentality to have in regards to what this game is and how it's designed to function. Um, but that's just my opinion. Uh, I don't want to contradict myself from Monday and say. Um, this is the one true way to play. This person here might be having a ton of fun, and you might be having a ton of fun running story games. I'm only giving you what's worked for me personally, and it may not work for you. You may not like a sandbox game at all, and you really want your players to be... Re I know I, have, I am friends with DMs that are like this, uh, and their players are like this, and they enjoy it, and it works for them. That's great. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for my playgroup. So... This is just work, what works for me. If it interests you, I suggest trying it out. Check out uh, Felbrig's Fantasy Scenario Generator. And check out my Blue Dungeon Generator. Uh, these things are all things that can help you make up stuff on the fly. And to become um, better at improvisation. Read, read books. Uh, read some classic mythology. Read Appendix N stuff in um, First Edition DMG. There's some good references in there. All of that is good stuff. So that's going to do it for this video, guys. Tell me what you think. Do you like very story-driven games? Do you just make stuff up completely on the fly? Or are you kind of like me where it's a little bit in the middle, where you kind of plan out the environment, the setting, and that's about it, and then you kind of just see what happens? It's exciting to me. If you like what I do, again, please consider supporting me on Subscribestar. It means a lot. Check it out. I'm trying to make it so you get, you get cool stuff. You get maps. You get adventures. You get supplements uh, once a month. So please check that out. Um, until next time, guys, I'll talk to you later. Peace out.